the uh, speak, uh, speakers and the, the faculty and the, as well as the, the people who have joined this uh, sixth uh, meeting of our ISHK, uh, mainly our teaching, uh, teaching program, and uh, welcome all of you. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Krishna Kiran. I don't think he needs any introduction, but still as a formality. Uh, he has he has he is a joint replacement surgeon at Hyderabad and a very young active man, and uh, he has a lot of publications uh, as well as uh, a lot of presentation uh, in this uh, our uh, own team and as well as outside. So welcome uh, Krishna Kiran, and uh, his topic topic is going to be on the revision exposure. So he is going to take us to the uh, most difficult uh, part of the uh, hip surgery, and. Uh, Krishna Kiran, you can take over. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So I have uh, brought a couple of videos, one of which was accepted at the OAS in the orthopedic uh, video theater. So hopefully uh, at the end of these three, uh, these two videos, we'll be able to give you a, a, an overview, brief overview as to what is our uh, protocol with respect to the uh, uh, way we look at revision surgeries. So, uh, is my video seen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, this uh, work, we, uh, the editing was done by the University of Pennsylvania group, but the video was uh, recorded uh, by uh, our team. So, the idea in any revision surgery is to get a uh, 360 degree exposure of the astablum, which allows us to safely remove well-fixed components, if any. At the same time, we will need to uh, assess and reconstruct the defects so that we have a durable outcome in the short as well as in the long term for the patient. So that is the type of exposure we are looking at. And typically the surgery is done through a posterior approach and we need to identify the interval between the gluteus medius and the posterior border of the trochanter and then create a plane there and not violate the edge of the tissue there. We have to internally rotate the femur and we believe that the progressive internal rotation of the femur beyond 90 degrees is the key to exposure of acetabulum. And there are four uh, steps which we follow and which I will show you in the uh, subsequent video uh, where we start off with the G-max release from the femur, from the linea aspera, taking care that we don't injure the first perforator. The second release is of the anterior capsule in front of the psoas. Third release is the adductor magnus from the femur. And the fourth release is the rectus femoris. And finally, the psoas is also released if required. Now, if, why is this important? It was found when, we, when there was a retrospective review of 354 uh, patients. There was a retained femoral component in about 75% of the patients. And this had around 83% survivorship at five years from the re-revision. The most common cause of re-revision was probably instability. but we all know that the femoral components tend to do better than the acetabular components in the long-term survivorship. And there is a significant possibility that we retain the uh, femoral component. Now, acetabular re revision versus isolated head and liner exchange in a retrospective review of 183 patients. There were 124 head and liner uh, exchanges and 59 acetabular revisions. And these had nearly 80% survivorship. So again, even if we have to expose the acetabular component and retain it and either change the liner or try to put a new cemented component, adequate exposure of the acetabulum 360 degrees is a mandatory issue. So this particular case we are taking to illustrate uh, the point. This is a case of a vertically oriented acetabulum with polyethylene induced osteolysis and wear of the polyethylene. You can see the eccentrically located head and uh, the approach is through the same uh, previous incision wherever it is possible but in a hip it is more forgiving because of the better vascularity as compared to the knee joint and we use the incision which is more likely to help us with our uh, exposure of the uh, implant in that particular case scenario. Now once you uh, do the dissection through the subcutaneous tissue you identify the fascia lata and cut the fascia lata from inferior to superior identify the gluteus maximus and split the gluteus maximus in the line of fibers. Now, as I told you, the first key step for the establer, uh, the exposure is to release the gluteus maximus insertion. This is quite broad, around 2 to 3 centimeters on the linea aspera. 
The next step is to identify the posterior border of the abductor from the greater trochanter onwards at an angle of around 45 degrees and go along the posterior border of the greater tuberosity, that is the greater trochanter. And you put your spike inside underneath the gluteus minim, uh, uh, medius to expose the minimus. And then the minimus is slowly separated out in the same line, which is an oblique line around 45 degrees from the tip of the trochanter. And subsequently, you position the anterior retractor underneath the gluteus minimus in order to retract these tissues away. So this gives us reasonable access into the anterior restabulum. Now you uh, make a radial incision in the scar tissue in the same line and then come down onto the greater trochanter staying close to the bone. And the key step in revision surgery is not to violate the edge of this particular flap. So we have to make sure that this flap is, uh, the all the dissection happens inside the confines of this flap. The edge is not violated. So what we are doing now is we are reflecting this flap out. And if you notice, I am working inside the soft tissue flap at an angle which is tangential to the direction of the sciatic nerve. Sometimes we do not know the direction of the sciatic nerve. All this uh, scar tissue and the polyethylene where induced debris is being dissected. And you can see I am working inside the flap and at a direction which is in the line of the sciatic nerve. It should not cut perpendicular to it. And we must not dislocate the uh, femoral head because it gives us a confines of the acetabulum with posterior, anterior dissections. And once that is completed, that is when you dislocate the femoral head. Now you assess the extent of internal rotation of the femur. And if you are not able to get the femur to beyond 90 degrees, we do subsequent releases. So you see here, I am releasing the gluteus maximus and completing the gluteus maximus release from the linea aspera there, attachment. And here the surgeon must be careful about the presence of the first perforator. Once you do that, now you are dissecting on the femur and you can see the psoas is coming into vision. And typically between the psoas and the anterior capsule, you dissect. And as, if, as I am dissecting and releasing the anterior capsule using these chicken scissors, you can see my assistant is able to more and more internally rotate the femoral component. Now, the third component of release is the adductor magnus release, which is not very well described. But this adductor magnus can be identified about 3 centimeters below the uh, level of the lesser trochanter. And you can see that the second perforator comes in there. Once the adductor magnus is released, the femur can usually be internally rotated beyond 90. And now I position my uh, anterior retractor into the anterior column in the direction of the anterior superior relaxed spine, but not in the direction of the anterior wall. Once you do that, now you have a 360 degrees uh, uh, exposure of the acetabulum. And this allows us to function to make our uh, uh, surgical procedures. Typically, the polyethylene liner is removed using a, a single screw which is drilled into the periphery. And with the help of the, uh, the, uh, the osteotomes, and then the screws are removed. And we use this explant device to uh, slowly try and take the uh, uh, cup out. So you have long and short blades which allow us to uh, cut the implant at the junction of the bone and the implant interface. And once the implant is removed without any damage, we can typically use a cup which is around 2 or 4 millimeters larger. You ream in reverse and wherever the reamer disengages, that is the size of the socket. So there is the AP capture which has happened for that particular cup. In these situations, typically we use highly porous materials like trabecular metal or gryption or a stick tight coated, which are multi-hole typically to allow us to get more screw fixation. Uh, and it is always a good idea to put two or three screws uh, in this in multiple planes in order to secure the acetabular component positioning. Now, once the uh, acetabulum is deemed stable in the correct inclination and version, then you position your liner. And typically, I tend to use a lip liner in revision scenarios using a highly cross-linked polyethylene. So you can use a 4 mm lateralized and a 10 degree lip liner in these situations because one of the most common causes for failure in uh, revisions is uh, the uh, instability. Now you remove the uh, head. So you can notice that I have not removed the head and I have been able to do the socket without removing the head. And now you inspect the trunnion for any damage. And we typically use what are called as the Goldberg criteria to see if there is any macroscopic damage to the trunnion and what is the extent of this damage. And then we assess the stability of the femoral component and see what is the extent of the proximal osteolysis 
and whether this will require uh, revision or it doesn't require revision. And this can be done at the initial stages itself. And you can see here that I've, I'm checking for the version of the femoral component and it looks good. And then we do subsequent trial reductions with uh, 0, plus 5 and so on and so forth to check which is the best possible uh, stable situation for this particular patient. Take the patient through range of motion. Ideally, you would put in a, an option sleeve adapter on the femoral component and a ceramic head. And because the option head was not available in this particular case, we used a ceramic uh, head. Once that is done, the entire posterior tissue, as you can see, can be closed back because we have not violated the edge of this flap. And that is how the post-operative x-ray uh, looks like with uh, the uh, cup, which is in ideal inclination version and the screws in good position and the limb length being restored to whatever it needs to be. Typically, in such situations where there is no augment used or uh, there is not much bone defect, immediate weight bearing, bearing as tolerated is used. Posterior hip precautions are employed for around six weeks, which include avoiding hip flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Home physical therapy is arranged until the first follow-up uh, around three week, two weeks for suture removal and six weeks for the first X-ray. And this is advanced to outpatient physical therapy as tolerated by the uh, patient. I can stop here if you uh, want to ask me a few questions uh, and then go to the next video. Or if you want me to go to the uh, video, I can. No, I think you, you carry on with the next video. Yeah. Krishna? Okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So this is just to... When we request the delegates, those who are there on the line, if they have any questions, please put on the chat box. So after this video, Dr. Krishna Kiran can interact and give the answers. So uh, we have seen how we can uh, retain the femoral component and just do an isolated socket revision using a four-step release process for the, uh, for the uh, femur. And that will... The key to establer exposure is the femoral mobilization. So you go more distal on the femur for better establer mobilization. So this is a case with a, a 3A type of defect, multiply operated, and you can see that there is a, a superior defect. So hopefully we'll try and show you how to expose the acetabulum adequately without damaging the superior gluteal neurovascular bundle. So in these cases, we do a more uh, Gibson type of approach rather than a uh, posterior uh, conventional posterior approach and the uh, idea here is to identify the superior gluteal neurovascular bundle from the greater sciatic notch where it is coming in and to protect it at all costs because in such cases where we do a standard approach and try and retract the femur too far anteriorly without uh, knowing we can inadvertently damage the gluteal neurovascular bundle so you can see here instead of cutting in the middle part of the uh, of the femur i'm cutting more anteriorly and taking the entire gluteus maximus off as a, a single flap. And this allows us exposure to the uh, uh, the neurovascular bundle. So you can see here where there's an alternative exposure method, which has been uh, popularized by the Adelaide group. So you can see I'm cutting more of the muscle towards the posterior side and uh, the uh, scar tissue will now be excised. Again, the key steps are to identify the posterior border of the abductor the posterior border of the greater trochanter and stay close to the posterior border of that thing. And whenever we are doing acetabular reconstructions, which are more massive, we need to keep a uh, keep a watch on the superior gluteal neurovascular uh, bundle, which comes from the greater sciatic notch. So that is a, a key step. So here I'm uh, exposing the thing. And because it was a, a spacer which was put by me, you can see that the exposure is much easier because I've already carried out all the femoral releases which were needed in the first place. So since it's just six weeks, it is much, much easier for me to do the surgery. So now we are excising all the scar tissue which is uh, present around the uh, acetabulum. And again, the femur, we are mobilizing, releasing the gluteus maximus completely, releasing the anterior capsule releasing the adductor magnus, releasing the uh, rectus femoris, and finally the psoas, 
is also released in cases where we are not able to internally rotate. So this is the anterior capsule release. You can see from the femoral insertion there, I'm releasing the anterior capsule. So previously I showed you with the chicken scissors, but wherever the scar tissue is more, you can use a uh, uh, diathermy as well. And I'm ident identifying the ischium and putting a pin into the ischium inside the soft tissue flap. I'm not going beyond the edge of that flap. And that allows us to expose the acetabulum uh, 360 degrees and the inferior retractor is beneath the transverse acetabular ligament and this allows us to uh, remove the uh, fibrous tissue and all the uh, things and in some cases we can also identify the transverse acetabular ligament which sets the inferior position of the cup. Instead of putting a high hip center, you can put in the native hip center. So this inferior retractor is uh, very, very important. And these instruments have been designed by Dr. Vijay Bose and this I find very useful, the Bose concept hip set uh, which has helped us. And that's the uh, location of the superior pubic ramus I'm pointing out at a 4 o'clock position with the osteotome. So I'll just go back to that uh, The uh, for the people. It is important in these situations with poor acetabular bone quality to put screws into the superior pubic ramus. And we have described this technique as a video technique in one of the American Academy uh, journals. And now you can see that I am just using the reamer to size the acetabulum in the anteroposterior direction. We all know that there is no superior acetabulum, but we still need to get what is called as the AP capture position for that particular patient. So if there is 40% host bone, I am trying to engage the available anterosuperior and posto inferior or a posto superior to antero inferior column to get a two point fixation. If you don't get this two point fixation, then the socket will just fly out. So the key step here, identify the in superior pubic ramus, keep reaming in reverse so that you don't remove too much of bone aggressively. And once the correct size appears, the reamer will just disengage from the uh, drill. And that will give us an idea that we have now achieved a two point contact point. So that is the provisional size of the socket we are going to employ in that particular patient. And whenever there is a significant superior defect for here in this case, from 10 o'clock to uh, 2 o'clock position, there is a big uh, defect there. And that defect we are managing using an augment. So the question again comes is whether we need to put the augment first or we need to put the cup first. So wherever we are using the augment for a primary stability, because you do not have primary stability with the socket itself, the augment is going in first. So the augment goes in first. You stabilize the augment with a couple of screws, but we have already done the AP capture point and uh, determined what will be the provisional size of the socket. So suppose you have rim till 60 and you think that 60 is the size of the socket. Socket. Now you use this augment, you fix the augment in the periphery. Uh, you can use a trial cup or a reamer, last reamer as a template for this augment so that the augment doesn't over constrain or come into the acetabulum and then make it smaller or narrower. So you have these augments, these are provisionally fixed with a screw and a K-wire and then you can ream between the augment and the residual host bone to fine tune the uh, final size of the socket. So in all these cases, what we do is we use a cup which has got ability for inferior fixation because we see there is no superior bone for fixing the socket. So you need to fix into the ischium, you need to fix into the superior pubic ramus and then you use a a uh, cup which is cemented in the correct position into this particular uh, cup. So the which is either a trivacular metal revision shell or the redapt cup which has got a pre-drilled uh, inferior locking screw into in the direction of the superior pubic ramus and the ischium. So here you see we are securing the augment with two screws and now we are converting this into a contained acetabulum. So what was an uncontained defect now became a contained defect. And now I'm again fine-tuning the position of the uh, size of the socket. I'm reaming between the augment and the remaining host bone. But I already know what is the AP capture point so that I'm not undersizing this cup. So the first step of doing a reverse reaming to identify the AP capture point where your reamer disengages becomes a crucial part of the uh, surgical uh, technique to avoid premature failure. Now, once we are sure that this particular, uh, the size of the socket is around 64 or 62 or whatever is the size which is best uh, engaging into the AP capture. Now you use this shell. This is the redapt shell. You can see there are two screws in the periphery which will engage into the superior pubic ramus and two screws which will engage into the ischium. 
So what you do now here is to secure the superior inferior third point between the augment and the cup using a cement unitization between the augment and this particular cup. And you don't move this cup till the cement sets. Because you try and move this cup, now the superior contact point is gone. What we have done, we have converted as uncontained defect into a contained defect, put a couple of screws into the augment, stabilize the augment, stabilize the cup between the augment and the, uh, the uh, re remaining acetabulum using cement between these two, so that now you have a toggle point. So when you try and push the cup inferiorly, it will not pull out into adduction. It will not fail in adduction. Then once the cement sets, you know the position of the superior pubic ramus, which you have already identified. They, there you will make your drill holes, fix the cup inferiorly, and this will prevent abduction failure of the socket. Because you have inferior catching points, you have a superior cement mantle and an augment which has got host bone contact and screws going through the augment, this construct becomes really stable. And now, once you have done that, I have done the inferior fixation into the superior pubic ramus, this can be done under vision. So, I, I, I showed you how you identify the superior pubic ramus and it is typically in a 4 o'clock position in the right hip and in 7 o'clock position in the left hip. And it is an exercise which you must do to identify. And once you have done that, now you can position the real liner in the correct inclination and version. And the cup you always position trying to optimize the amount of host bone contact. So already the host bone contact is around 30-40% in this case. So you don't look at where the inclination and version is on the socket. So we are employing what is called as a hybrid philosophy. We are using the uh, augment for host bone contact. We are using the cup for residual host bone contact. And then we are using the cement for superior unitization and a cemented liner to correct the inclination and version. Once you do that, now you prepare the femur. You see the leg is held at 90 degrees. I'm preparing the femur using this progressive sequential reaming technique. And in this case, we are using a, a fluted uh, distally fixing uh, 265 stem. So typically it is done initially with hand. You identify the reduction point for the particular patient and then keep on upsizing till you cannot uh, engage the reamer further in. So this particular system, uh, Monomod has got a shoulder reference mark, which you can mark as the reduction point on the greater trochanter and then optimize that particular uh, reduction point by keeping on upsizing the implant so that it will be ideally sized and it will not subside over a period of time. So this is a modular fluted uh, stem, uh, non-modular fluted stem, which is titanium and which has got multiple uh, flutes on it for additional stability and it is grit plastered. And this is a standard of care for most of the uh, uh, revisions nowadays. We use a non-modular titanium uh, grit blasted fluted stem and it's a conical stem. The, the, typically the cone is around 2.5 to 3 degrees of uh, taper and that is what is done by the uh, the reamers which have the preparation. Once the implant is stable, there is no axial instability, there is no interface mobility and there is rotational stability. So these three factors we have to look at it. Then we do your trial reduction, sleeping position, flexion adduction, internal rotation. And then finally you use the real implant in the correct version and typically it goes in uh, you can see the proximal part is HA coated and you can see it will not go beyond the line which was marked for the correct reduction for this patient. So what we do, we get a provisional fit for the stem. We identify the reduction uh, because it's a non-modular device. You need to have stable reduction and then you keep on upsizing till you cannot engage your re uh, reamer with power beyond the reduction point on the shoulder reference and that will be the correct size for that uh, uh, particular patient. So once that is done, you put in your uh, definitive uh, uh, head and if there is a abductor deficiency or a trochanteric convulsion which was there uh, before surgery in this patient, you will need to repair that particular uh, thing down either with uh, wires or with ethibond or fiber wire, whatever is the uh, preferred method of fixation for the individual surgeon. And this is again important uh, to uh, optimize. So here we are using the suture material to uh, tie the abductor down through transosseous sutures. You can see that. And sometimes you can aug augment it with the posterior half of the uh, gluteus maximus for additional stability for that particular patient. And we've had good results 
in in our hands and that's what we are doing so we are uh, uh, taking the gluteus maximus and repairing the gluteus maximus onto the uh, posterior part of the abductor there in order to augment this uh, particular uh, construct and that's the final closure you must have a watertight closure uh, because the risk of oozing from this huge wounds is larger and we are tending to use uh, vacuum assisted closure for the first week or 10 days in uh, some of these patients where the dissection has been huge and we have done major job on both acetabulum and on the femoral side especially in the setting of uh, discontinuity and this is an important part of the operation where you need to do the watertight closure yourself or you must have an experienced fellow who who understands the importance of this particular uh, closure and that's how the post operative x ray looks you can see the uh, inferior fixation into the acetabulum you can see the superior augment and you can see uh, that the uh, construct is relatively uh, stable and this patient is about a year out or uh, i think is about few months out and he has done uh, reasonably well uh, so far thank you thank you dr krishna karan oh. um i'm sure dr pachore um, i i was not able to join uh, because of some audio problems but um, to all the uh, colleagues those who have joined here dr krishna kiran is um, the alumni from aims and he worked uh, in all in into medical science for more than 10 years and after that he has taken uh, the subsequent uh, uh, exposure in germany and uk and he is presently the director and head of the department at the medical hospital uh, in hyderabad so on behalf of uh, our managing trustee dr vikram shah usually he is there in all the lectures today he is not able to come uh, dr sharan patel the president leo joseph our secretary the patron dr pachore all the executive uh, board members and my colleague dr dana shekar raja the member of the education committee i take this opportunity to thank you uh, for sparing time and giving this excellent talk on the uh, the exposure and the revision uh, hip techniques so i thank uh, krishna karan for uh, sparing the time and uh, giving this talk i think there's a uh, one uh, question for you is on the uh, something uh, they want to know about rectus femoris release you can see the question answer on your screen or chat yeah. uh, so uh, the uh, the rectus femoris is at the we are looking at the Uh, two heads are there for rectus the straight head comes from the anterior inferior iliac spine and the reflected head usually comes from the anterior part of the capsule so that can be released when we release the anterior capsule from the uh, anterior part of the acetabulum so that's a part of the exposure so once we do the anterior capsule release the rectus femoris automatically gets uh, released there and that is an important uh, step to again translate the, so the idea is to translate the femur anteriorly safely so if you don't internally rotate the femur adequately that is if it is you're struggling to internally rotate it's very unlikely that it will be able to anteriorly translate the femur well so the key is to uh, uh, take out all the impediments for internal rotation of the femur so wherever you are able to get the internal rotation beyond 90 degrees that is when you will be able to do the acetabulum so for the junior surgeons they need to understand the acetabular exposure is the femoral mobilization it is not lying on the acetabular side So if it is difficult go more inferiorly on the femur release the gluteus maximus properly take care of the uh, perforators release the anterior capsule release the adductor magnus release the rectus femoris which is anyhow done and then if still we are not able to internally rotate the femur then the last resort is to release the iliopsoas which we are not very keen to do mostly because the iliopsoas uh, release can cause persistent lack of flexion in the patient for up to a year and that can be quite debilitating for them whenever they are coming out of car or climbing up and down these steps but in difficult situations that 300 degrees release needs to be done krishna if i can just ask you one question about the uh, fixation of the acetabular component yeah uh, so basically i do agree that you have to hold the cup in position until the cement sets but the idea of putting in the screws after the cement sets especially if you are putting in screws which are away directly away from your augment 
uh, aren't you worried about dislodging the uh, cement uh, uh, the uh, the cement mantle dis dis disengaging itself because of distraction forces coming from the screw so uh, i sometimes tend to put it in before the cement sets and then get some more cement in uh, so that i'm really worried about uh, disengagement at the uh, cement and the uh, augment cup interface so what's your take on that so that's a very interesting uh, valid point so we we have done all of that so we will initially start with the inferior screw fixation and then try and put cement in between or uh, do it while the cement is setting what i noticed was the maximum disengagement happens when we try to put this uh, screw between the before the cement sets so either you put the inferior screw and then you, you have augments with the within a few where you can inject cement at a later date so which would be an ideal situation but most of the trabecular metal augments we have or the other augments which we have we do not have the option of injecting cement between the uh, between the cement and between the cup and the augment so i tend to wait for the uh, cement to completely set if the cup was coming out with this screw torque then it would anyhow fail so then you have to go back to square one and uh, do the whole thing again that means your ap capture size is not accurate you are trying to put in a smaller size socket and just depending upon that cement to hold because now you are don't have an ap capture you have some gap between the inferior bone and the cup and that is trying to you know when you are talking it the cup is being taken close to the bone it will cause disengagement of the cement so it will serve as a sign for us that we have not sized it accurately as well because here you know you uh, all of us have seen that it is not a 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 type of situation most of the times we do not know especially in a discontinuity type of situation or where the inferior bone is very uh, deficient we do not actually know the ap capture point we are just guessing in majority of the situations so it will serve as a surrogate marker whether our size of the socket is right or not so this step of allowing the cement to set then using the screws so sometimes what i do is i uh, if i'm using a trabecular metal revision shell i'd make a drill hole in the superior pubic ramus i put in a small blunt k wire into that uh, uh, thing and verify the position on a uh, operator oblique and a uh, inlet view and see if the screw is in the direction of the superior pubic ramus so i'm all all set then i allow the cement to set and then position this uh, screw and i had reasonably good outcomes in my hands with this particular technique dr pachore i think is it now is now our two three points yes sir uh, <clears throat> i agree with a couple uh, quite a bit of things but our two three things which our experience uh, to experience our revisions one thing after the your tfn and another thing uh, as you mentioned we don't expose the nerve at all we just palpate if it is possible if it is not possible you just keep the what you did a fantastic dissection and everybody should appreciate that you remain close and once you release your gluteus maximus adductor adductor and rectus what the gentleman told you that is very crucial we are we i have stopped releasing anterior capsule reason is you are doing too much of global release it be the hip becomes a lax so only when i am i have a difficulty i will do the anterior capsule or an anterior capsule i learned from my boss we don't use this uh, chicken scissor i just remain close to the intertrochanteric anterior anterior bone and just release off release off that what i do that do that is what uh, I would agree with you, sir. Uh, that is why it's a sequential stepwise. So yes. the uh, if you don't get the internal rotation, then you release it. If it, if you get, you I am not ninety. I get hundred, hundred and ten. Then you don't. Anti retractor. <laughs> yes, anti retractor. And if then you are able to get it with G max release, you don't release the next. Yes, release. yes, yes. Secondly, so, putting an anterior retractor has to be uh, not in the anterior uh, lip. It has to be far. of the and you will not blame your assistant that you have broken the wall correct that is another report uh, important point i just want to ask you you put an augment and you start remaining do you damage the little bit of uh, the trabecular uh, this one it does happen sir little bit uh, does happen because that particles are uh, not uh, you know they are they are, Uh, very high frictional uh, the soft tissue gets catch up you know that's a trade off so 
if that patient fails because that of third body wear i would be happy because i'm more worried the cup will pull out or something like that no because you have taken try you have done so many things you have already got a little bit of ap capture it is not going to be a solid fixation because you don't have something superior holding almost uh, one third of the socket so but if you notice i am not uh, reaming like a, a reamer it's just a gentle hand ream between yeah. the thing on the reverse so i am not trying to ream the augment i'm just trying to gauge what is the uh, uh, reverse fixation between the augment and the uh, cup and the remaining inferior wall what i found is if you don't do that sometimes the cup doesn't seat uh, as we uh, want it so uh, your point is well valid we should not do uh, uh, reaming in the forward direction into the augment that will cause more problem so just trying to do a gentle sizing of the yeah. uh, fine tuning of the size that's all yeah. and if you have good ischial bone why don't you put a ischial screw also so we do put an ischial screw also yeah which will also give additional stability whatever the best can be uh, the first uh, uh, screw will be an ischial screw followed by the superior pubic rim screw that is true that is what we do so those yeah. are the two screws which we get other screws we will not get so the superior stability is through the cement and uh, you're not removing the head that is because you think that it will damage the trunnion or that because you that's why you are releasing too much of anterior to put a pocket there if you just take it out you have more space uh, krishna i would agree with that sir yeah we can, but you can put some uh, syringe or something on the trunnion and yeah no, we put actually we have some uh, protector we put it back and i don't put a retractor there to damage you just put a tape and give the tape to the uh, very strong tape to the uh, assistant the front so the little pull and you are able to do the you are reaming in proper anti wear anti wear yeah uh, i think this is uh, a point well taken sir thank you and small trick uh, when i do antibiotic spacer i that tfl i use uh, uh, the ethylon ethylon so you have a you know where when to go where to go there so exposure is just 10 minutes I don't have to find out where i am i was in the last surgery so use the ethylon interpreted ethylon and that gives the direction of where you cut the this is one of the small trick uh, i i do use, use this is just for the beginners that uh, you know whenever yeah. you use an antibiotic spacer that will be yeah and probably revision i use a one drain that is okay there is a controversial little so that you know just for a 24 hour maximum 48 hours no, not more than that we, we have also uh, restarted drains sir although we were little bit cowboyish we have bought uh, hands uh, because i think uh, there is special for revision and not yeah, for revision planning. revision yeah. he definitely is yes sir this car tissue you know it uses uh, krishna quite a lot so yes, that is only thing uh, which i would just put one drain my boss used to put two drain at the time but i have reduced to just one drain one drain same thing and a fantastic exposure krishna and Thank you. a lot of technical points and uh, I learned quite a lot of things, uh, so everybody is going to take this um, important, very important exposure and other things. Yeah, thank Krish you, Krishna. Krishna, once again, uh, thanking you on behalf of all the uh, East members and committee, and Dr. Dhanas Sekar Raja, my colleague. So, uh, thank you very much. I think we move on to the next uh, talk, uh, which is on the knee subject, and uh, the speaker is Dr. Leo Joseph. He is the secretary of the. Uh, Indian Society for Hip and Knee Surgeon, a very well-known surgeon working uh, in Thanjavur, and he is trained in UK, and he is going to be talking on the hot subject of alignment. So, which is uh, the one which we need to know. Uh, the pendulum is swinging from here, uh, one side to another side. So, Leo Joseph, the Secretary of Fisks. is going to speak on the alignment conundrum in the knee um again leo on behalf of i should not uh, thank you because you are part of us uh, so on behalf of all the uh, uh, members of the executive board and uh, my colleague dr raja i thank you for sparing the time and uh, it's all to you before he starts i just want to remind i'm also going to tell again the next uh, session in the february is on 3rd of february 
uh, on Saturday, same time, 7 p.m. And we have Dr. Manuj Vadwa, a very senior surgeon from Chandigarh. He's going to talk on the uh, valgus knee part. Uh, earlier, Dr. Parak Sanchoti covered the varus. Uh, Dr. Manuj is there. And we have a um, young surgeon, uh, Dr. Karthik Patel, who has done uh, probably the maximum number of direct entry approach hips in the India. So he's going to talk on DA. So we have two speakers uh, in the February the 3rd. Please note the date. We'll be sending you the reminder. Please tell your colleagues also to join. And I request uh, Dr. Leo to start his presentation. Uh, good evening, uh, sir. Thank you so much for your wonderful introduction. And thank you, Pacharisa, for allowing me this opportunity as well. So uh, the talk that I'm going to be talking on is the alignment conundrum in the knee. It is indeed a conundrum as we keep going further. And uh, it's only confusing ourselves even further when we go into the details of it. So we know that joint replacement surgery is one among the most reproducibly successful surgeries in orthopedics. In some cases, however, at least on the knees, we know that when the surgeons are very happy with the work they have done, they have done with the patient, the patients don't seem to reflect that happiness because they are not really that happy with the results of the surgery. Unlike in the hip, which is very forgiving, uh, and where the forgotten hip score is very high, we know that at least 20% of our patients who undergo total knee replacement are not entirely happy with the results of the procedure. And there is no amount, there is an N amount of literature on the same subject, depending on the authors. The numbers vary, but the average is about 20. Why is that? Uh, the little old man in the middle uh, is Michael Freeman. And he probably has done more work on assessing how the knee moves than any of us put together. And uh, of course, there have been a lot of work which has been done by other authors subsequently using different techniques. But with of those works you read, you will realize one thing. The way that the knee moves is so complex that there is no way any artificial knee can reproduce that kind of a movement. So is it possible that this may be the reason why patients are not entirely happy with the way their total artificial knee works. In fact, this is the hypothesis that Nobel et al. came forward with, and they called it the impairment hypothesis. The fact that this knee, which is an artificial knee, is not moving exactly as how a native knee would move, makes the patient feel the knee as uh, perceptively being different, and hence the patient is probably not happy with it. If that is the case, then at least every patient or at least a majority of the patients should be unhappy with the results of the procedure, which is not the case as we know it, because we know at least for sure that 80% of our patients are happy with it. So which means there are other reasons why patients who undergo total knee replacement are not entirely happy with the procedure. So what could those reasons be? So as we go a little further, dive in, as we dive in a little further, now let us look into a few recent terminologies which have come into the picture. The concept of the medial tibial, uh, medial proximal tibial angle, the concept of uh, the lateral distal femoral angle, the concept of arithmetic, arithmetic uh, hip knee angle, angle, the concept of mechanical uh, hip knee angle, the joint line of obliquity, and so on and so forth. So these are basically new terminologies which have come, which we shall see a little further as we keep going further down. So is it possible that there is something with the way we do a dotony replacement which is contributing?
right alignment for that patient. So let us have a clear goal. Let us aim for the uh, bullseye in the form of a 90 degree, which we know which we can reproduce reasonably accurately. Now, he also said that has, adds another advantage to the way we do the procedure because that prioritizes symmetrical loading of the implant, especially the tibial tray, thereby minimizing the chances of loosening. Now, if you have to do that, then by essence, you have to elevate the medial joint line by some degree because you do not know how much of joint alignment, joint uh, uh, surface loss has been has occurred on the medial side. Now, there is invariably a variable amount of uh, loss of uh, loss of bone on the lateral side, which may be zero to a certain amount at least. So we are depressing the lateral surface line. We are elevating the medial surface line to some extent. And once we do that, then obviously we will have to rotate the femoral component, take the distal femoral cut parallel to the, pro the proximal tibia and also rotate the uh, distal femoral component to some degree of external rotation to try and match the tibial uh, cut. Now, assuming it is a three degree varus, you rotate externally the femoral component by three degrees, which is what most mechanical alignment jigs do. And then you have a symmetrical rectangular flexion angle, flexion gap. However, if you are looking at a patient who has a native varus alignment of, say, minus six or minus eight, and then you have or on the plus side as well. And then in that case, you're going to externally rotate on a standard basis, the femoral component by three degrees. Obviously, you're going to cause some amount of mismatch on the flexion side at least. So obviously, there is probably a scope there for uh, the reasons why patients may be unhappy with the results of the procedure. So this is exactly, uh, the, now, however, what Insol said was exactly borne out by what uh, 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 Jaffrey published in 1991, where he popularized the concept of zero plus or minus three degrees, whereby he said that the mechanical tibial, fem femoral tibial angle should be such that it passes through the middle one third of the tibial, uh, tib uh, tibial uh, proximal tibial plateau, which corresponds to an angle of zero plus or minus three degrees, which should be our aim. And that kind of became the Bible or the philosophy of doing total knee replacement. And based on this huge amounts of how huge amounts of money have and time have been spent in technological progresses in the form of cash and other methods of bringing out an accurate mechanical alignment of 90 degrees. And a lot of literature, a lot of uh, stories went by that name as well. But this paper, uh, by Parate, Separate and Mark Pagnano from and Dan Berry from Mayo kind of changed the way we look at things. For instance, what they said was they looked at survivorship of knees uh, over a period of 20 years and uh, in terms of mechanical alignment. And what they found was that even up to 10 degrees of virus alignment, there was no difference in the long-term survivability of implants. So essentially what they said was zero plus or minus three did not matter. If zero plus or minus three did not matter, then let us look at how we're going to do total knee replacement here. Now, it makes sense for us to aim for zero on the patient on the left. Both the x-rays, one on the left and the one on the right, are elderly women. They're, all, they're both in their 70s and they both have no pain no arthritis related knee symptoms. They've been kind enough to model for me. And both of them are in my relative, in the circle of my family. And if you look at the knee on the very left, if that lady is going to develop an osteoarthritis and you're going to aim for zero plus or minus three, it makes perfect sense. And the chances are that she's going to be very happy with the results of the procedure. However, the knee on the right is also a relatively good knee, there's not no significant osteoarthritis, but she's got a native virus of close to 10 degrees. If that is the case, then what would be the logic of trying to correct the knee on the right to zero or plus or minus three and straightening it out? Now, again, if you counterpose this along with what uh, Dan Berry published from Mayo, what would the law, if even an inadvertent 10 degree virus did not seem to affect long-term results, 
is it even logical to try and correct a virus of 10 degrees with this uh, for a patient who's lived with a virus of 10 degrees to uh, uh, downright neutral as uh, zero plus or minus three and then say that this is the knee that this is the knee that it should have been unfortunately nature didn't give you that knee and so we gave this to you so could this be the reason why this patient may be unhappy with the results of the procedure this is exactly what Johann uh, Johann Bellemans came up with with his with his concept of uh, of uh, constitutional virus. What he said, what he did was that he essentially assessed normal, healthy, pre-arthritic knees, and what he found was up to two thirds of men and up to seventeen percent of women had a virus of three degrees or more. And uh, they all have, and, and more importantly, only less than 5% of patients had a neutral mechanical axis. So he came out with the concept of constitutional virus. Essentially, what we're looking at is the fact that we are now beginning to acknowledge the fact that um, there is nothing called a normal knee, or there's nothing at least called a knee, which has to be normal only if it's zero plus or minus three. We all come with huge ranges. I don't think a, I, you, you, you cannot deny the fact that the knees that you're looking at are perhaps the peak of their performances. They're all footballers and they are all happy knees. They are not arthritic, they are not painful, and yet each of them is either in virus, valgus, or straight. So there is nothing called normal here. And how do you define where you do a total knee for these, Asian, for these patients? So as the confusion progresses, this is where Stephen Hall, uh, Hall comes in with this kinematic concept. And then he said, you know, perhaps the way right we are doing it totally is not trying to bring it out to zero plus or minus three, but accepting it where it is. And then, of course, there were, there were huge fluid concepts in between which came around. So what is the kinematic alignment that Hall speaks about? Essentially, it tries to recreate what they try to it tries to estimate the probable degree of osteochondral bone loss, which you can do by calculating the arithmetic mean, which we have seen. And then you try to do a pure resurfacing procedure of the proximal tibia. That is, you take symmetric amount of bone on the medial and the lateral tibial condyles, assuming that you're giving the right amount of leeway for the probable amount of bone loss that might have had because of osteoarthritic wear. And then you take your proximal distal tibial femoral cuts parallel to the tibial cut, adjusting again for ligament laxity on either side. In fact, Hobble uses calipers to try and correct the amount of bone loss and then restitute the same. And then he accepts even up to 10 degrees of virus. Now, that is an extreme alignment, but then it was it, it, a, a guy who has been doing mechanical knees for a long time would be aghast at this kind of an alignment. Probably an X-ray would look horrendous. But how do these knees survive in the long term? Is there a validity to this? That's exactly what these guys found out. Class, and in this published in this publication of the Journal of Arthroplasty in 2020, what they found was that the revision rates between uh, knees which have been done using the unrestricted kinematic technique and knees which have been done by either mechanical or other manual or cast have no difference at survival. Uh, both of them are about the same, around 3% at seven years. So kinematic alignment does seem to work as well. No, but there is a difference, however. So the knee on the left is a kinematic knee, while the knee on the right is an imbalanced knee placed in virus. So a kinematic knee does not mean that the knee is put as and when you want it, wherever you want it. You put it there, but make sure that the ligaments are well balanced and aligned. The whole concept is balance of the ligaments. Let us not forget that. So Mactasy brought out this call, this way or this classification, which is called the CPAC classification. I would suggest that you, you all go back and read this. Uh, this is basically a coronal plane alignment of the knee classification. And this is where they came out with the concepts of the uh, medial proximal tibial angle and the lateral distal femoral angle and the measurement of the arithmetic mean, which is uh, deductive, which is the reduction of the lateral distal femoral angle from the MPTA or the joint line of liquidity where you add up the two values. And then they brought out nine different phenotypes of knees. They're either varus with an apex distal or neutral with an apex distal or valgus with an apex distal or apex, uh, apex neutral or apex proximal as demonstrated here. So my daughter was kind enough to 
look into these and make these measurements and draw these measurements for me. So this is a patient of mine who has got a normal knee, relatively normal knee on the left and relatively, uh, and, and obviously uh, osteoarthritic knee with varus on the right. If you look at this, there is a 10 degree mechanical varus on the right, while it is zero on the left with mild osteoarthritis on the right, on, on the, uh, on the uh, sorry, on the left, with a right knee, which is about 10 degrees in varus. However, if you were to assess what would be the amount of uh, varus that you will have to restitute, if you were doing any of the alignments other than mechanical, then if you do your measurements, if you see here, you're getting a 80 MPTA of 80, uh, I think 87 and uh, 80, 85 and an uh, LDFA of 87, which gives us a varus of minus two which is probably the native virus of this patient. And if you look at the opposite side, which is actually zero in, in, the, in terms of MP, a mechanical axis, but if you look at it here on the right side, you get a plus nine, plus one degree. So this was probably a um, plus one valgus knee, which is slightly sunk into varus and is now is having one degree varus. There is some amount of osteoarthritis, osteo osteophytosis. So there's early osteoarthritis on the left while on the right. It is very severe osteoarthritis. But then we know that while the mechanical alignment is 10 degrees, the arithmetic mean, which arithmetic hit a uh, uh, knee angle, uh, angle is about minus two, which is probably what you, we would be aiming for if we are to do a total knee replacement in this patient. What McDaisy also did was uh, take a few normal knees in the uh, population and try to plot them uh, 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 with regards to the alignment. And what they found was only 32% of patients were in the neutral with apex distal alignment, which means at least more than two thirds of the patients were in the other alignment groups, only one third at least were in the neutral apex distal alignment. So long years ago, uh, I remember uh, sitting into a, in, in a classroom with uh, Professor Rolf Birch from Stanmore, and uh, I was actually asked to make a presentation on on uh, on, on patellar instability. And uh, when I said there are dozens of uh, procedures described for correcting uh, patellar instability, the next he immediately came in and said, "I'm going to stop you there," and uh, and said, "I'm going to ask you a question." If there are so many procedures described for a particular uh, issue, what does it say about the procedures? And I linked and I couldn't came up, come up with an answer. None of us could. And then he replied, it means none of them work, or at least all of them are as good or as bad as each other. If there is one procedure which works excellently well, then that would be the procedure which would be accepted. So when I look at this list of alignments on the right, that is exactly what I am remind, reminded about. We know that some of some most of these, when if well done, work well, but are they better than the other? Time will tell. But for the sake of convenience, let me look at only mechanical, kinematic, and restricted kinematic and functional in this presentation. So we've seen what kinematic is, we've seen what mechanical is, what is restricted kinematic. Well, Ventitoli said, Stevens says, Howell says minus 10 degrees is fine, but that is too much of a varus for me. I'm not going to accept it. So he's going to say, he said, let us now restrict the amount of varus that we accept on the tibial side. Let us say an arbitrary or probably a reasonable value of five degrees of varus, and that is my upper limit. I'm not going to go any more than five degrees. But if I'm having to go more than five degrees, I'm going to retain it within five degrees and I'm going to do my ligament releases and then try to balance out that knee. Fair enough. But as robotics came, people thought, or at least we thought probably correctly, that we have more accurate tools of cutting. So, and we know how much we can cut and how much angles we can cut it in. And so Mark Pagnano and Faris Haddad came out with a functional alignment concept. What it is, is basically a balance-driven strategy, which is based on 3D constitutional alignment, which prioritizes soft tissue balance. Basically, you stretch out your soft tissues, assess how much of gap you have, and then retain the soft tissue gap, and then cut your bones in such a way that you end up having a rectangular flexion and extension gap so that your joint fits in perfectly well in both inflection and in extension. 
function alignment obviously cannot be done without a robotic assistance. So let us look at this example. For instance, the knee on the left, uh, it's got a mechanical alignment of 9.7 degrees in varus. However, when we do the measurement of the, the uh, measurements, the arithmetic hip knee angle is minus 1.1, which is probably what you're aiming for. Now, in this particular case, if we were to plan for a unrestricted kinematic philosophy, this would what we be doing. This would probably be what we would be doing. I should thank Sohas from Sunshine for giving me these slides. He's been kind enough to share them with me. Now, if you look at the, the image on the left bottom, obviously the tibia is in about 6.5 degrees of Paris. Now, this is a, a kinematic alignment. If I'm believing, if I'm a believer in that, I would go ahead and take my cuts as they are. However, if I am an arithmetic uh, guy, uh, if I'm a restricted kinematic guy, then I'm going to say, no, 6.5 is too much. Let me try and reduce it a little bit more. So bring it down to about four degrees of arrest and then take my cuts and then take my femoral cuts appropriately. And if necessary, do a little bit of ligament balance, ligament releases to get my knee aligned. However, in functional alignment, you have a three-dimensional look at the joint, and then you know how much of joint gaps you have on either side. Out here, we have 14 millimeters and 21 millimeters on, on, on either side. You take your cuts in such a way that the ligament, the, the gaps are balanced out to about 18 approximately, and you have the exact amount of joint gaps and space needed to fit in your implant in both the flexion and the extension gaps. Now, it is all fine to say that I can take a perfect cut and then I can put in a perfect joint and then it feels good. I agree that it feels good when you do it operatively. But let us look at the probable questions that can arise. For instance, most of these designs, at least two, two of these designs depend, two of the robotic, uh, robotic uh, designs in the market depend upon stressing out the ligaments to get captured the stressed ligament gaps. How do we stress them? Now, oh, there is, for example, there is a, there are methods of doing it. There is a retractor called this retractor, for example, which is promoted by one one company. Now it is very fiddly. It keeps slipping around, and then it it varies. A, a, a person who's got a lax ligament will open out a little bit more than a person who's got tighter ligaments with this kind of a retractor. And even otherwise, it is fiddly. It keeps slipping on either side. So, are we really capturing perfect ligament gaps? We don't know. Then there are there's the other version of it where you don't capture ligaments at all. Some of these designs just ask you to put it into varus and valgus val stress to assess how much of ligament stress is there and then decide your components. So is it important to stress the ligaments or is it not important to stress the ligaments? Again, there are no no answers. It depends upon the brand that you use, them, the, the the company that you the, that you promote, which decides which whether you stress them or you don't stress them. How do you stress them? There is a lot of if and but there, but the questions remain. More importantly, how much do we stress the ligaments to capture the gap between the ligaments? Now we know that for a given amount of stress, for example, there is a there is a company in the market which says we use 100 newtons force to stress the ligaments. Is that enough? Is that the right amount of stress to be given for every knee? Now again, if it is an average, and here we are looking at customized knees, and we are using technology worth crores and crores in order to bring out such a capture, such an accurate knee. And we are here fidgeting around with ligament balances. We are fidgeting around with ligament alignments where we do not know what the native laxity of that ligament must have been in the first place. And then we are stressing them all equally without knowing what that native alignment is, where the native laxity would have been. Then obviously your going caps are going to be different. Again, we do not know. Ligaments are the weakest link of robotic knee replacement at this point in time because we do not know what a native ligament is. And then, more importantly, on the lateral side, we know that and we, uh, when, I, when I, for instance, when I started training in the UK, we used to say we should have the ligament balance be so perfect that there should be equal amount or no movement on either side. Probably a few degrees, a few millimeters opening, but equally on both the medial and the lateral side. And then when you start doing total knee replacements, you often see that the lateral side is slightly laxer than the medial side, but patients are happy anyway. And then we used to talk about it in subtle hushed tones, but now patient, now it is accepted. A little bit of lateral laxity is fine. Why? Because the lateral laxity is offset by active functions by the femoral, the biceps femoris, the popliteus, which are all 
which are all very uh, active stabilizers of the knee. They're not static stabilizers. So in that case, they, they make up for it. So a little bit of lateral laxity is fine. So when we are doing a total knee replacement using robotics, how much of lateral laxity do you accept or how much of lateral laxity you chase after and tighten up? Again, there is no way of answering that question because we do not know. As I said, the whole concept of assessing what the alignment should that needs to be provided depends upon assessing the arithmetic mean. Okay, so and this is what we were talking about earlier: the MPTA and the LDFA, which are the two alignment two, two assessments that you do. And to get the MPTA, you need to have a good proximal tibia. Tibia. If you don't have it, then obviously you're fidgeting around. How do you measure MPTA for a knee which is so arthri arthritic like this, where there is bone loss? There is no way you can assess an MPTA for a patient with bone loss on the tibial side. So again, what are you going to do? And what was the native alignment that you're going to restitute for this patient? There's no answer to that as well. Now, most of these designs depend upon you deciding at least a few anatomic landmarks, including the, the uh, epicondyles and, uh, other, and, and, and others, for instance, your, your, your malleoli, et cetera, and et cetera. Now, I can, I, can, I can tell you for sure that even if I were to do it for the same patient a half a dozen times or one dozen times, the chances that I would hit the same spot again are probably less than 50%. And if two different surgeons are going to do the same thing, they would probably do, use two different landmarks as the same. And again, if a few millimeters doesn't matter, what is the point of doing the robotic anyway? Again, uh, how much of internal rotation do we accept? There is a limit. This is a revision that we published for a severe internally rotated total knee replacement. Which uh, could not, which could not be tolerated by this patient, obviously. So there is a limit to the amount of internal rotation that we can accept for a given patient. So if you're going to keep your knee in 10 degrees of varus, you will have to internally rotate your femoral component at least by 10 degrees. Is that acceptable? We don't know. There are obviously potential downsides to varus positioning of the tibial implant, for instance. How could how will the asymmetric loading of the tibial base plate affect the long-term wear and polyethylene? What about the shear stresses that are going to come on to the cam post mechanism if you're using a tibial uh, uh, PS implant? The unanswered question persists. To conclude, the way we do we our total knee may be becoming to, more accurate, but the goal, for instance, our gun is becoming longer. accurate, but the goal that we are looking at is becoming sensation. hidden behind the small I, I, I wall of smoke. The meal. proponents of alternate alignment strategies argue that it improves short-term functional results. But can we yet reconcile long-term survival Europe. with immediate functional results? We don't know. This is, in fact, it's going to be the or, or theme for our bank. upcoming conference on the 2024 April at the at Calcutta. The satisfaction after total knee replacement is multifactorial. There are alternate, alternate alignments in robotics only attempt to look at one factor, that is alignment or the accuracy of it. Now, to do a, let us be clear about this. To, to do a mechanically aligned total knee, we don't need robotics. But do we have clear evidence to state yet that mechanical alignment must not be the way to go around doing a total knee replacement? Again, we don't have answers to that yet. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Um, so my question to you, I think you stress enough that there is a distinct difference between alignment and balance. So the most important point, as you have mentioned, even if you keep it three degree virus or a kinematic alignment, the the balance is the most important thing in whatever alignment you do. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, can I say something on that? Yeah. yeah. The uh, the mechanical uh, standpoints and the balancing standpoints are different from kinematic standpoints. Because the kinematic alignment, uh, in principle, tries to restore native collateral laxity, which is uh, a trapezoidal gap in flexion and somewhat balanced in extension. So uh, functional balancing is different, like where you are trying to make uh, coronal, sagittal and rotational adjustments to balance the knee in extension and flexion. So that's a different uh, ball game. But all kinematic philosophies don't try and balance the knee. So they will just look at native collateral ligament laxities and try and accept it. 
whether that is valid or not only time will tell but the most important point is what was the native uh, uh, alignment and what was the deformity at the age of or what was the alignment age of 30 and what the alignment age of 60 um, how do we judge on that what was the native alignment do we have any any guidelines for that or we just accept uh, yeah, whatever yeah. So it is a dicey thing to try and assess uh, the native alignment. We are second guessing basically. After 30, 40 years down the line, we are basically second guessing what might have been the original alignment. But a good way of doing it is using Magnesia's Ally idea, provided you don't have proximal tibial bone loss. So that is a reasonable ballpark figure to go with. If you if you have a, a patient who's coming to you with a varus of 20 degrees uh, to 10 degrees and then uh, probably 10 degrees, not much of bone loss. And then you look at the, uh, you do your calculations and you have an arithmetic assessment of about minus 1.1, minus 2 degrees, which means that the native alignment may have been around minus 2. So you give 3, 2, 3 degrees either way, probably doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, but then again, you there are a lot of if, uh, ifs and buts here because you don't need to have, you should not have bone loss on the tibial side. If you've had bone loss, then there is no way you can look at the native alignment. But native alignment is one thing. What about native laxity? How much do we, how do we judge native laxity? And uh, how do we decide which patient needs which amount of tightness on the medial side and which amount of tightness on the lateral side? There are absolutely no answers to that. We go with the feel. We go with the feel when we do a mechanical total knee replacement. But in in when we do a robotic, we have images which tell we have values and images which tell us how much of laxity is there. Now, how much laxity do we accept, and how much laxity actually do we go after? We don't have answers to that. Right, Doctor Pachore, any comments? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Leon. Yes, sir. Yes. See, the, there are four bar linkage system in the knee, which Michael Freeman was the person. You know it. Yes, you, sir. You are with, an, uh, with the total knee, you are breaking this system. And you are asking artificial to joint to work like a nature. How it is possible? It is exactly. just not possible. It is just yes, not possible. Sir. And that's the reason you have varieties of knee coming in. What you said the, regarding uh, Patela, different, different. Um, approaches for a recurrent dislocation. Same thing we are doing with the uh, multiple designs in the knees have come. That means there is something still going on. That is one. You quoted uh, Dan Berry's paper. That is a 20-year back paper. The population was different. There were a lot of robotic patients, the, the elderly patients, low-demand patients, and that's why the survival was okay with Meryl Ritter and as well as the Dan Berry's paper. Today, we are operating a younger, very active population. That's why my worry with this uh, different type of alignment is going to be a little worrying. So we need to keep a watch very carefully. The reason is, Angar, you have not mentioned the idea of three degrees virus was Angar Ford. He came to Mumbai to show the surgery. And uh, we did a couple of the, uh, couple, uh, he is the only person during that time in 90s had uh, two tibial uh, aligned uh, jigs. One was a three degrees virus, other was neutral. neutral. And uh, um, to our surprise, the, these knees, they failed at those who get, went into virus. Whatever, the, that was a di different story because the uh, implants were different at that time. So Dan Berry's paper, don't be, you have to take it very seriously, Dan Berry's and Meryl Linton's paper, because the population was totally different. The other part is now, you are, again, you are blaming, initially you blamed the navigation garbage in and garbage out. So again, you are doing the same thing in robotic. Those who are without CT scan, again, you are likely to garbage in, garbage out, because the point, uh, medial and uh, the... Uh, Epicondyl again are going to be problematic, and one degree here and there is going to be such a tremendous difference if you are not going to use the CT scan. So I think uh, there is no question that uh, we need to this new technology. We have to observe very carefully. Uh, uh, Krishna, can any comment on this? <laughs> the hundred percent agree with you, sir. Our thoughts. 
or uh, thoughts so we we have been uh, doing uh, robotics for the last 4 5 years what i find is that most of us actually do what is an adjusted mechanical alignment so we are within 3 degrees of uh, neutral so we can play around 3 4 degrees maybe and uh, you are trying to balance the knee we are not trying to leave it unbalanced because we know as leo rightly pointed out if you leave the knee unbalanced it will fail so will fail. we are yeah we are looking at balancing the knee none of us do the uh, fancy work i think i don't think anybody is doing uh, the unrestricted kinematic alignment all the people may say they are doing unrestricted kinematic they are actually doing adjusted mechanical because you do 3 degree varus on the tibia two on the two valgus on the femur overall alignment is one so when you look at magdesis paper also plus or minus 3 was considered to be neutral so if it was more than 3 degree varus or more than 3 degree valgus then they considered to be an a varus uh, outlier or a valgus outlier or something like that so most of us uh, we don't accept um anything so i would agree with you you would remove the acl and then remove all menisci and expect that need to function well whether you do kinematic mechanical or anything it won't function it's a compromise so more i would uh, personally think that medial pivot probably will come back most of the designs will come back with the uh, acl substitution of some kind to replicate the knee kinematics and uh, adjusted mechanical concept which we can use using robotics i think that's what my take home if i can ask you something karan um if yes yeah, so like basically we don't really have evidence to suggest that any uh, that a knee potent varus performs badly or uh, provided ligaments are balanced knee potent varus performs badly or any better than a knee potent uh, plus 0 plus or minus 3 and yes. vice versa a uh, well balanced knee potent 0 plus or minus 3 doesn't perform any inferior to that put in a functional alignment or a or a or a or in a varus position as well so when we know that even up from dan berry's paper 10 degrees of varus doesn't make a difference uh, what is the what is the uh, point of you know finicking about being finicky about 1 2 degrees of varus and uh, valgus and uh, rotations uh, when we do robotics is there a valid reason why we do that or is it because we are just looking at the numbers and we can Uh, so what we did was uh, uh, we had the same doubt and we looked at patients uh, who were undergoing robotic surgery with a mechanical plan and we saw what was the difference in tightness on the medial and lateral sides. So the default plan was to make the lateral side in a varus need to zero zero in flexion and extension and see how much is the medial tightness. What we noticed was we could significantly bring down that bring down the medial tightness. without doing soft tissue releases by minor adjustments in the sagittal coronal and rotational position of the implant so it is a much more elegant way of dealing the surgery so our rates of pcl recession all this came down significantly so it was around less than uh, 0.25% in my hands although when we were doing manual surgery we were recessing around 20% of the patients with uh, cr knees because we are not able to balance the sagittal plane so i personally believe that if we use the technology uh, properly subtle changes in flexion extension of the femoral component adjustment of the tibial slope rotation and the coronal obliquity of the implant uh, in the line of the native obliquity within acceptable boundaries will make the operation much more uh, elegant with much less need for soft tissue releases that's what has been my observation over around uh, 2000 cases now so we have done a study on 400 and there was significant difference in the outcomes uh, at least up till 6 months in the uh, range of motion and how the patients perceived the knee uh, after 6 months they equalized but i think our uh, surgery becomes much more elegant we tend to do too many soft tissue releases dr pachuri sir has pointed out when i was uh, showing the hip video as well that some of the releases may be inadvertent it may not be necessary because it will create more issues for the patient which i think is wisdom and that's what has been my observation in, the, in any comments about the recent australian registry data which came out uh, about robotics the uh, see the uh, whatever is the data which is coming out on uh, the different uh, methods that robotics superior or cas or superior very very difficult to you know extrapolate it to our own practices so i think eventually we have to look at what works 
so I am not a big fan of uh, uh, Regis. Regis can show pointers, and you know our practice needs to be superior to the registry. It cannot be uh, similar to the registry. Okay. Um, I think uh, uh, we, uh, we need to thank both the speakers. Uh, it's 8.30. We're not on time. And uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Krishna Kiran and Dr. Leo Joseph for sparing time. And uh, all the participants, those who attend this lecture, Dr. Pachore, or patron. So on behalf of Dr. Dana Sekar Raja and myself, the Education Committee, we thank both the speakers. I just want to remind that the next talk is going to be on 3rd of February, Saturday, 7 p.m. And we have two speakers, Dr. Manuj Vadva from Chandigarh and Dr. <coughs> K. Patel, uh, who is going to speak on the DA uh, uh, from Ahmedabad. So do join. Please spread this message uh, to your friends. And uh, we look forward to see you again the next month. Meanwhile, I thank Dr. Pachore, Dr. Krishna Kiran, Dr. Leo Joseph. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Leo. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks, Krishna. Bye. 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 Bye, Leo. Bye. 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 Recording stopped. Dr. Pachore, are you going to be on? He left, sir. He left? Okay. Yes. Fine, fine. All right. Okay, okay so good night. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.